Good morning, class. Uh, today's lesson is for July the 5th. Christian Homemakers class at Fairmount Christian Church. It's being recorded on uh, July, July, June the 29th. It was great to see many of you yesterday at, at church. Uh, definitely strange not being able to give anybody a hug or shake anybody's hand, but you could see, see faces, hear voices, we could talk to one another. I thought uh, the elders and the deacons and the, the staff did a great job uh, in terms of you know providing the masks, the portable communion cups, uh, which are uh, unique in and of themselves. They give me a hard time. But anyway, it's, it's totally set up. Um, I went to the 1015 service with Linda. I think we will, we will start trying to come to the 8 a.m. service and see how that goes. Many of you in the class must have gone to that service. And so I hope to see you on this coming week. Uh, today we begin our study of the 12 Minor Prophets, just like uh, the sermon series of this summer. And we'll be discussing these books in a little bit more detail uh, than the format that we're using in terms of sermons, and rightly so. The question is always for a teacher of these Old Testament prophets is how much is too much? How much, how much detail to go into them? How to avoid repetition? How to give some historical background without having people's eyes roll back in their head. And so the plan for today is to do a brief historical introduction and read the first three chapters, uh, all the verses of Hosea. We may or may not get that far, but that, that's what will happen next week to the extent we don't finish it this week. And then for the remaining chapters of Hosea, I will be uh, picking and choosing selected passages and putting that together as a summary. And we will read the, the appropriate Bible verses and go through the remainder of Hosea, but not verse by verse. And each book is different and will be treated differently. Uh, some like Joel, uh, we will read every verse. Zechariah, for example, is a very important a prophetic book, not only back then, but for today, today's times and perhaps for the end times as well. And much of that uh, will have to be read verse by verse, even though it's not the, the shortest of the minor prophets books. So bear with me and in uh, and, and today and in future lessons, I hope you will pray for me uh, as I continue to uh, lead the class for the time being uh, in these lessons. And then hopefully we'll be together soon. And with your uh, questions and your comments, uh, it'll make the class even better. So with that said, Hosea, where are we? Well, we're at that point in the history of Northern Israel where times are good. They're really good. They've been good for 50 to 60 years. Now, how did the divided kingdom come about? Just a brief reminder. Remember when Solomon died, he had a son, Rehoboam. And the people came to him and said, you know, your father was a, a stern taskmaster that worn us out. Uh, are you going to cut us some slack? And uh, Rehoboam gave the wrong response. He said, if you he essentially said, uh, if you think my father was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. So they left and were decided they want Jeroboam, who was one of Solomon's right hand men when it came to constructing much of uh, the walls and uh, buildings and whatnot, construction around Jerusalem. And so he became king and the prophet Ahijah told him in the beginning, he said, now look, if you'll do what's right, 
then your kingdom will last a long time to you and your descendants. Uh, and so Jeroboam uh, the first uh, didn't give that a second thought. From the very first day, uh, he led the people in uh, auto worship. It was he who set up uh, the temple sites, if you will, of Bethel and Dan, and put the uh, golden calves there, and set up the city of Shechem, if memory serves me correctly. Don't hold me to that. For the people to worship as well, because, see, he didn't want people going to Jerusalem. He wanted to keep every, everything on his side of the fence. Uh, that, and plus, he, he did not have a heart that was right with God. So in successive kings in Israel, you have your good times and your bad times. So let's go a little bit more into detail there. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom, and he, he ministered in the days preceding the fall of Israel when they were conquered by Assyria in the year 722. He begins his ministry during the reign of Jeroboam II. And uh, his ministry probably lasted s somewhere from like 770 or 760 AD, all the way until the end. Uh, he does not mention the actual fall of Northern Kingdom, the defeat of Samaria, the end of the three year siege there by the Assyrians. So he may have been alive in 722, he might not have, but he, he had stopped prophesying just a handful of years before that. Now Jeroboam II was the king of the Northern Kingdom from 793 to 753. So a long reign. Now he, just, he and his, co, uh, his contemporary in the Southern Kingdom, which was called Judah, was Uzziah, otherwise, otherwise known as Azariah, who had a, a, a quite a long reign too. Now between these two kings, they were in the course of their reigns, able to expand the territories of Israel to the north and east, to the south and to the east, to almost make uh, Israel as large territory-wise as it was in the days of of David and Solomon. Uh, so it was, it was good times and bad times, but they always managed to get themselves in trouble. And if they didn't have anybody else to fight with, they'd fight with one, one another. Um, before the accession to the throne of Jeroboam II, the situation had been quite a different one. Military attacks by Assyria and Syria had brought uh, humiliation to the Northern Kingdom. And this would be in the time of uh, Jehoahaz, who was his grandfather. At the time of his grandfather's reign, listen to this, the strength of Israel's army had fallen to only 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers. The king of Syria had destroyed the rest and made them like the dust at threshing time, 2 Kings 13. So, you know, recovery from this low state began with Jeroboam's father, Jehoash. He defeated the Syrians on three different occasions. Then Jeroboam continued this resurgence and brought the country to a strong position already noted. Now, prosperity. What can you say about prosperity? Uh, it usually does not mix well with God's law. Hosea's generation living at the close of Jeroboam's reign and after that, knew of humiliating defeat or foreign oppression only through the memories of their fathers. By this time, there had been peace for about 60 years and with it, economic prosperity. The land was again producing abundantly. Many people were becoming wealthy. 
luxuries had once more become common. Building activity was flourishing on every hand. Hosea chapter 8. And this led to a widespread feeling of pride. Read that in Amos chapter 3 and chapter 5 and Isaiah chapter 9. Now, seldom does prosperity lead to behavior that pleases God. This was true at the time of Israel, and it's true today. Social and moral conditions developed that were wrong and degrading. Side by side with wealth, extreme poverty existed. Through dishonest gain and false balances in the marketplaces, the strong took advantage of the weak. Those who had wealth felt free to oppress the orphans and the widows, and even to buy and sell the destitute on the public markets, Amos chapter 8. Justice seemed at a premium, and the courts did little to help. Religious conditions were no better. The Baal cult, the calf worship at Bethel and Dan. <clears throat> Hosea, speaking against this kind of idolatry, referred to it as the worship of Baal. It was also sacred prostitution at these sites. People still built high places and set up images and Asherah poles. Uh, a, a go goddess of fertility on which all sorts of things happened, debauchery, drunkenness, uh, again, the sacred prostitution. I didn't realize that's, a <clears throat> excuse me, that's an oxymoron, but prostitution was part of the, of the worship, believe it or not. And according to 2 Kings 17, the people set up images and these poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. Now Amos had preceded Hosea in preaching against this idolatry and sin, but the people paid little attention. Now it was Hosea's turn. And the fact that Hosea, Amos had met with no success did not make Hosea's task any easier. Remember Amos uh, camp came from the southern kingdom of Judah, but nonetheless was a prophet slash missionary to the northern kingdom. So there's a little bit of history, but since we're going to be studying a number of books that deal with uh, prophesying to the northern kingdom, I thought it would be good for us to just read some passages about these kings. Jeroboam II uh, was the one primarily talked about in Hosea, but after him, there were six kings over the next 30 years leading up to the destruction of Samaria and the carrying off of the people from the northern kingdom to Assyria. Uh, there was Zechariah who reigned for six months, murdered. Shalom, murdered, served one month. Nahim served for 10 years. Uh, Pekiah served for two years and he was murdered. Pika uh, reigned for, I'm pretty sure it was eight years. I don't have it written down. Uh, he was murdered. And the last king who reigned for nine years uh, <clears throat> was Hosea. Not Hosea, but Hosea. And in the last uh, years, the first huge defeat and carry off of people. I was brought about by the ruler king of Assyria called Tiglath Pileser III, otherwise known as Pul, P U L. And then the gentleman who uh, seized and laid uh, siege to Samaria for three years was Shalmaneser V. And with that said, let's read a few passages from uh, First King, Second Kings. If you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 14. We're going to read really not many. Uh, 6, 3, 9. Mm -hmm. okay. What you would probably be considered a chapter, chapter and a half in 2 Kings 14, 15, and 17. All right. First of all, we're going to start with where Jeroboam II, who's king, when Hosea gets a start, when he ascends the throne. So chapter 14, verses 23 to 29. 
In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Job, Jeroboam the first, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Now he was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hepham. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering, and there was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. As for all of the other events of Jeroboam's reign, all he did in his military achievements, including how he recovered for Israel, both Damascus and Hamath, those were Syrian cities, which then belonged to Gaudi, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jeroboam rested with his fathers, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, succeeded him. Now, every one of the uh, descendants of Jeroboam, I think, were murdered. Uh, most of them were. And remember, we're going to have a number of kings in the final 30 years. And none of them will, will do well. And none of them returned to God. None of them sought God or wanted to have anything uh, to do with him. Let's go to uh, chapter 15, verses 8 to 10. Now, Zechariah, son of Jeroboam the second, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he, he reigned six months. And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his fathers had done. He did not turn away from the from the sins of Jeroboam the first, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Uh, it goes on to talk about how Shalom inspired against Zechariah and assassinated him and succeeded him as king. And nothing more uh, really is said about uh, Zechariah other than he only reigned uh, six months before he was murdered. Shalom <laughs> had even worse luck. He served one month before he was murdered. And we read about that in verses 13 to 31. Now Shalom, son of Jabesh, became king in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah. He reigned in Samaria one month. Then Menahem, son of Gadi, went up from Terza up to Samaria. He attacked Shalom, son of Jabesh, in Samaria, assassinated him, and succeeded him as king. Down to verse 16. At that time, Menahem, starting out from Terza, attacked Tipsa, and everyone in the city in this vicinity because they refused to open their gates. He sacked Tipsa and ripped open all the pregnant women. I mean, how, how much, how, 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 can it get any worse than that? Renders you speechless just to read that. Continuing in verse 17, and now in the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria 10 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. During his entire reign, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. You know, it's a, a familiar thing, other than kings getting murdered, is that the idol worship set up by the first king of Israel, Jeroboam the first, uh, never went away, never changed. These people followed him. They kept the calves, kept the worship sites, the prostitution, the idol worship. Here comes a slight change. Then Paul, king of Assyria, invades the land, and Menahem gave him a thousand talents of silver to gain his support and strengthen his own hold of the kingdom. And when Ahim exacted this money from Israel, every wealthy man had to contribute 50 shekels of silver to be given to the king of Assyria. So, so the king withdrew and stayed in the land of Israel no longer. That didn't last long. Imagine that. 
Uh, you cannot pay off the mob. You cannot not assuage the mob. Uh, they ask for an answer. When you give it to them, suddenly you are yard short. Uh, and Menahem, verse 22, rested with his father, so Micaiah, his son, succeeded him as king. Verse 23, we'll kind of summarize this for you. Micaiah, Menahem's son, becomes king and reigned for two years, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't turn away from the idol worship. Jeroboam began. One of his uh, chiefs, chief officers took 50 men and uh, assassinated Pekiah. His name was Pekah. And so Pekah succeeded him as king. And he reigned pretty much the longest one of these. He, he reigned 20 years, but that was, he was, he was co-king, if you will, co-regent for quite a number of years uh, with Menahem. So he actually only, um, he had sole reign for, for eight years. He also did evil in the eyes of the Lord, didn't turn away from idolatry. Now when he's king, now remember he's going to be the second to last king. Uh, Tiglath Pileser returns again, takes a number of towns. He took a lot of some territory on the east side of the Jordan and deported many people to Assyria. I think it was 30,000, if I remember correctly. I think it's in Chronicles. Uh, then Hosea conspired against Pekah and assassinated him. He became king. And now we finish up with chapter 17, verses 1 to 23. And that'll get us all the way to the end, literally, of the kingdom of Israel. Chapter 17, 1 to 23. Now in the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. So he was bad, but he wasn't super bad. Now the good, good new guy in town is Shalmaneser. He's, taking, he's become king of Assyria, and he comes up to attack Hosea. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hosea was a, tra a traitor, for he'd sent envoys to the king of Egypt, and he no longer would pay tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, Shalmaneser seized him and put him in prison. And the king of Israel invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. And in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. All of this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt under the power of Pharaoh. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel, Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. At every high place, they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that provoked the Lord to anger. They worshiped idols, though the Lord had said, you shall not do this. The Lord had warned Israel and Judah through all of his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey, and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their fathers did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he made with the fathers and the warnings he had given them. 
They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them. Although the Lord had ordered them, don't do that. Don't do that as they do. But they did the same things the Lord had forbidden them to do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God, made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts. In other words, the stars, you name them. However many you could see, that's how many gods that they had. And they worshiped Baal. Listen to this now. This is where they also obviously uh, worshiped Molech or Chemosh, who required this. They came to do likewise in Jerusalem. You know that from having read Ezekiel. We studied Ezekiel and Jeremiah. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and sorcery and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left, and even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices Israel had introduced. And then we will read in our list of minor prophets several that ministered uh, to Judah exclusively. And we will see, you already know how the story ends there too. Just the Babylonians eventually took Judah into exile as the Assyrians did in 722, Judah would be no more as of 586, quite some time. When he tore Israel away from the house of, oh, let me go back. Therefore, verse 20, therefore the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted them and gave them into the hands of plunderers until he thrust them from his presence. When he tore Israel away from the house of David, they made Jeroboam, that's the first, son of Nebat, their king. Now Jeroboam enticed Israel away from following the Lord and caused them, and caused them to commit a great sin. The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence, as he had warned through all his servants, the prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Syria, and they are still there. And they never really return. I guess they call them the Ten Lost Tribes, but whereas Judah would eventually come back to the land when Persia defeated Babylon, fulfilling many prophecies of the prophets, the Northern Kingdom was to be no more. And so that's the historical perspective of the Northern Kingdom from the time of Hosea until the very end. And I hope that gives you a, a sufficient uh, background so that we can begin the, the study of, of Hosea. I think we have time just to read probably the first chapter of Hosea. So let's do that so we can say we got into it today. Verse 1, Now the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Notice that he dates the, the time of his ministry according to the kings of Judah, not the kings of Israel, since he no doubt knew that the kings of Israel would soon pass away and would be remembered no more. And during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an unchaste or adulterous wife and children, un, un, and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Deblain, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, most, most scholars and commentators will say that Gomer was a chaste woman. She was not a prostitute. 
But this was looking forward into the marriage. And God was indeed telling Hosea not to marry a prostitute or an adulteress. Well, that would make that would make uh, Hosea an adulterer as well. But that she was pure at the time he married her. But was looking to the future when God knew that she would become unfaithful and she would produce children of unfaithfulness. Just like God, when he made the covenant with Israel, did he not know that Israel and Judah both would become unfaithful? Well, yes, yes he did. But nonetheless, he chose to marry Israel. Here, whether this is a parable or in reality, I happen to believe that, that it is real. Hosea is going to do the same thing. It's an object lesson. And make him presumably an extremely effective prophet in Israel. We'll, we'll see as we move along. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu, the massacre of Jezreel. Jehu was a former king of Israel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. This is looking forward to the time of the Assyrian uh, destruction of, uh, of Samaria and how they would attack. In terms of punishing the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, it's kind of, it's kind of confusing. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 30, God commended Jehu for uh, what he had done in carrying out God's commands to eliminate Ahab and Jezebel and their household. The only thing that I can come up with the commentary that I'm using today said he had sinned in killing more people than God had intended. I, I couldn't, I couldn't find that. Um, but what it appears that he did was he did, in fact, kill the then uh, king of Judah, uh, Ahaziah, and maybe that's where he left uh, God's command to kill only the household of Ahab. And went too far. Now Gomer uh, conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lot Rama, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Then I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horse, horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. And after she had weaned Lot Rama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. All right, we have to stop there. Didn't quite get through it. How many more verses do we have? Then we've got one more. Let's finish it. Two more. Yet the Israelites will be like sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited, and they will appoint one leader who will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. And we'll talk about what prophecy or prophecies that what that was fulfilled in the past and perhaps will be fulfilled in the future next week. So thanks for uh, taking another half hour out of your life and uh, choosing to join the rest of the class, Christian Homemakers in our studies now of the minor prophets. Pray for me as I do pray for you. Father God, uh, keep all the class safe and well, we pray. Uh, we ask for healing for those that are physically ill, for those that are in financial distress, we pray that the, uh, they will be able to find employment. Uh, for those that have other needs, you know what they are. And we ask that you uh, heal them of, uh, of these issues, and in the meantime, according to your will, be with them, bless and comfort them in whatever situation they find themselves. Please bless our study uh, of your Old Testament prophets, and may we learn the appropriate lessons to follow you and not, uh, and not disobey your commands. 
Pray us when we do fall short, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. See you all next week. <laughs>